Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, uh, and we solicit your prayers. Uh, we are, the number of us are heading to the airport uh, to catch some flights a uh, little quickly after service for a, a pastors and leaders conference we're taking the pastoral team to uh, in Washington, D.C. to uh, do some thinking and growing together and get some training on how to be more faithful and, and responsible in our ministry. And so uh, we're going to the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. Some of you may have heard of it. And, and uh, so glad I get to take the pastoral team with us and uh, get us an opportunity to hang out a little bit together. Uh, so we solicit your prayers as we travel uh, because we certainly want to uh, get there safely. Amen. And uh, while, while you're praying, uh, pray, pray for Sharice uh, and, and the girls. They're heading down to, uh, uh, where are they going? Los Angeles, amen. And uh, I, I, I was notified of this thing they got now called uh, Snow Week, <laughs> praise God. And I, 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 was, I, was, I was stupefied, I was, I was, I was stunned that uh, they, they canceled school for a whole week <laughs> <laughs> for, for folks to get a chance to go to the snow. And I just said, man, I was raised in the wrong era, praise <laughs> God. Uh -huh. Amen. So they, they're heading down to Los Angeles to go see their new, newly born cousin. And uh, uh, Sharice's sister, Quinette, and their partner had a baby. And so we're so excited for them. So just pray for them and they'll travel safely. And everybody will get on back to where we need to be. Now, First Corinthians chapter number 3 is a, a wonderful lectionary passage. It is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, Corinth is one of the most diverse cities in the Roman Empire. It's a major port. It is a place of great diversity, uh, cultural diversity, religious diversity. Uh, you had in the Roman Empire uh, this city as a major outpost, but still connected to the empire in all of its uh, kind of uh, military and uh, uh, commerce practices. And so uh, you find in this particular city, uh, Paul uh, founding a church. And uh, this is one of the earliest writings of Paul. Many uh, attribute to uh, easily uh, the mid 50s or 60s. So uh, this is a time uh, where you are, are literally <coughs> hanging out with people, some of whom are alive, that we're hanging out with Jesus, right? Like th these are some folk that were still alive and they saw with their eyes and heard with their ears or, 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 or witnessed the reports of this, 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 this God man, if you will, this individual who, who did uh, things that no one had ever seen or heard and left such a powerful legacy uh, in the 30 years uh, since his death and resurrection that now people all across the Roman Empire are starting to gather regularly to reckon with the words and the life that he lived. And, and it, 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 it goes to, to, to show you and I that there is indeed a, a power in a history. And being able uh, to, to not believe that the world began when you got here. <laughs> Amen. I know that's a newsflash for some of you, amen? And uh, it's, it's, it's probably the greatest lesson you'll take from this message today. That uh, there was indeed a story, there was a struggle, there was uh, a, a set of ideas, uh, there it was and is a legacy that predates us. And part of our task then is to wrestle with that which has come before us and and really reflect on what then is our call to live faithfully in this moment right now. And so 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 is a wonderful and powerful uh, text because it is Paul's effort to help the, the church in Corinth not fall into the kind of divisions that make their public and their, I say, their private witness uh, less compelling to those who are curious but not yet convinced. Uh, how many of you are conscious that you are always surrounded by people who are curious about your 
life and choices as they relate to your faith, but not yet convinced. And, 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 and part of the lack of convincing may have to do with some of the other expressions of some of this same faith we call Christianity. As I prepare to uh, speak tomorrow at the conference, you know, one of, one of our most seminal questions will be, uh, as the church in America uh, continues to exist in this context, our struggle, dare I say one of them, will be how we will follow this Jesus we claim to be the Savior, but also which Jesus will we follow? Because it is indeed the case that we see a lot of folk who claim to follow Jesus, but it appears to be a totally different Jesus than some of us know about. Or dare I say, uh, uh, call to be our savior. And so uh, in this letter, Paul is actually teasing out some of these, these, these problematic associations we may make that would get in the way of us being fully formed after the way and the life of Jesus. So let's take a look here at the biblical text for a few moments and see what the scriptures speak to us. Chapter number three, verse number one of First Corinthians, the scripture says, And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food. For you were not ready for solid food. Even now, you still not ready. Amen. Ask your neighbor, are you ready today? Amen. Verse number three, four, you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh? And behaving according to human standards or human inclinations. For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another says, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos and what is Paul? They are servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. Verse number six, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. So rather, or neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God. Everybody say, but God. But God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. Verse number nine, I love, for we are God's servants. Working together, you are God's field, you are God's building. Amen. What a great word for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from uh, the topic today, uh, why we have that secret sauce. Amen. <laughs> why we have that secret sauce. Let's pray, God. We thank you for the word that has been read for the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you and let the anointing of God that makes preaching and teaching easy may rest upon me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Come on, come on, look at your neighbor, tell them you got some secret sauce today. Tell them that, you got some secret sauce. Maybe take your hand and say, we got some secret sauce. We. How many of you like cooking? Any, any, any chefs, all right? Just everybody look around so you can be mindful of, of where you want your small group to be. Amen, everybody else, you bring in the plates. Praise God. But if you a chef, you know about the secret recipes uh, that added together make your experience of cooking and eating a gift from God. Uh, and that while some sauces are quite known, uh, meaning you can go on Patti LaBelle's 
you know, that's what I do. You know, I'm trying to eat healthy, so I, 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 I now know how to cook some Brussels sprouts and, and, and asparagus. Touch your neighbor, amen, amen. Patty LaBelle and them helped me out. Amen, and you know, uh, get a little, little garlic, praise God, a little butter, just a little bit, not too much, because it kills the whole point, amen. And a little, little Parmesan cheese and, and put it in a bag and I shake it real good, praise God. Then I just lay it evenly out on some foil on a tray and cook it for, you know, about 10 minutes where it's not too burnt, praise God, but it's not too, you know, uncooked and it blesses me. Amen. That was not a secret. It was on Patty LaBelle's thing. Amen. But I've been in places with my grandmother trying to make some sweet potato pie or banana bread, and, and, and she don't even share what she's doing. Amen. She just talking to you. Oh, hey, honey, and just taking things and, and doing like that and, and, you know, throwing it over her head. And, you know, I'd be like, well, I'm, I mean, she's like, oh. You know, I don't even know, I don't know what it is. I watched my mama do it, amen. And her sweet potato pie and banana bread don't taste like nobody's I've ever tasted. She got some secret sauce going up in there. Something you can't imitate or duplicate. Well, I don't wanna be too verbose with this point, but I do wanna suggest that we are a part of a great church community that has a good secret sauce that we've at least been able to name some of these ingredients. And why I want us to at least bring to the surface some of this today is because as quiet as is kept, we as followers of Jesus are always attempting to make a convincing proof of why it makes sense to rock with Jesus. And, and, and part of our proof must not just start with us. I mean, it is indeed a great blessing as we celebrate Black History Month and all of these kind of cultural celebrations as a part of our liturgical worship uh, to be reminded that there have always been people throughout the history of our lives and faith that have had to endure hardness and struggle and still find God in the middle of it as a source of strength, hope, and light. That it is not the case that we are the first ones trying to figure out why does it matter to follow Jesus? And you know, sometimes I ask myself that, yes, your pastor, the preacher, amen, I, I be looking like, Lord, you know, following you right now is quite an uh, act of faith because some of these folk make you feel like you shouldn't be following Jesus if they following Jesus because that Jesus they following seem to be, you know, something else. <laughs> it seems to be anti-me. You know, ever, ever felt like you, the, the, the faith ascribed to your tradition was anti-you? Like this is kind of outside of you may have all kind of life experiences and they don't feel like they all add up to, 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 to the kind of faith that you see uh, expressed. And, 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 and even, even when you take a little deeper, part of, part of the challenge we have as, as, as followers of Jesus in the American context is that there are so many whose faith has been formed in spaces and places that you're still trying to get away from. And this is part of what this passage, the lectionary passage, is such a gift to us because we see even at its earliest, most infancy stage, the church has always been struggling. How can we live into the Jesus who plants and waters and gives the increase? and not be over-identified with the ones God assigns to help shepherd us along the way. Hello, somebody. 
I mean, in as much as I love to be your pastor, and I know Pastor Erna and Pastor Tanisha, Minister everybody, we all love our roles. At the end of the day, our role is to help introduce you to a deeper, more intimate knowledge of the creator of the universe. It's not to make us famous, amen. Because if we want to be famous, we probably do other things. <laughs> I mean, at least I know I would, amen. I try to, you know, I don't know, go practice my jump shot about 20 something years ago. Or, you know, uh, I had a coach tell me I, I could have been a good football player, so I probably would be running around getting my body broke up or something. I don't know. Uh, but, 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 but there is another deeper calling that I think many of us are, are here to live out, and it is to help you remember that you are not of Paul, as the scripture says. You don't belong to Apollos. You don't belong to Pastor Mike or Pastor Erna or Deacon McBride or Reverend, you know, chicken dinner. I don't know. You, you, you belong to God. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I belong to God. Amen. And, and, and part of our task is to remember that we belong to God and we belong to one another. And that is what it means to be a church, to be a community, to be a people that do not allow our differences or our, our, our associations to override the shared connection we have with God and one another. I mean, it is indeed uh, quite a challenge at times to be connected to certain folk when it seems like you have nothing in common. But how many have ever been in a, in a healthy, mutual relationship with someone that was very different from you and you became a better person because of it? Amen, amen, amen. Uh, uh, Bell Hooks has this nice quote uh, uh, about uh, what, what kind of, uh, of things happen when we all are able to, to, to live in share community. She says that dominator culture has tried to keep us all afraid to make us choose safety instead of risk, sameness instead of diversity, and moving through that fear, finding out what connects us, reveling in our difference, this is the process that brings us closer, that gives us a world of shared values, of meaningful community. It is indeed a gift to be a part of not just a church community, but a history that is not just about sameness, but it's also about diversity. It's about the many ways and unique contributions, the secret sauce, the special contribution that you and I and we make to bring our lives into full as the scripture says, the image of God. That apart from one another, we are only a glimpse of the image. But together, we can more fully be a reflective image of God. And so here at The Way, we try to talk about our secret sauce, if you call it. They're kind of four uh, uh, DNA uh, uh, what do you call it? Four, four values or things that make up our DNA. And the first is that our faith in Jesus, we take that so seriously. We, we're not here like, you know, uh, 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 wavering on what it means to, to, to live lives that are, are deeply connected to the life and the ministry of Jesus, appreciating that there are many that have come before living out this way of life and have, even through all of their challenges, still found a way to say, I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. And so we, we, we some Jesus folk over here. Amen. Give me a high five and tell them, I'm a Jesus folk. Amen. I, I, Jesus is, I, I, like, I like rocking with Jesus. Amen. There's something about that Jesus that I don't mind. So, so faith and spirituality, a huge part of our DNA. And then we also talk about that we are a church where home and belonging are easily described as a critical reason why people keep coming through. That it's good to be able to come home and feel like, man, I never left. 
Amen. You know, my, my, our, our house is the, the my, my parents' house now is the house we all grew up in. But whenever we come there, it's good to be home. Amen. It's, I don't never feel like I'm not at home. Except when they change the locks. No, I'm just saying. They've never. <laughs> True story. Amen. We, I have the same key to my parents' house from, I don't know, fourth grade. I don't, first time I got a key. The key still worked, barely. Amen, it's, it's, it's worn down, amen. Uh, but never been locked out of a house. If I get evicted today, I know I at least got a key somewhere. Somebody say amen, right? Because it's good to come home. But isn't it good to be able to come to a church community, even if you only come once a month or every day, every week, or you, you one of those CME saints, Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. You come three times a, a, a year. But you know when you come, boy, it's good to be home. And that to belong and to be home is, is a good touch point. And people always say, there's so much love at the way. And that's a great way to describe our church. And yet we still have people say, you know, while I'm here, I want to go deeper in relationship with you. I want to learn more about you. That while I'm going through transitions, I want to be able to know that whether I'm single, whether I'm married, whether I'm divorced, whether I have kids or no kids, whether I'm engaged, whether I don't know what I'm doing, whether I'm in school, whether I flunked out, whether I'm employed, unemployed, that there are always some folk who can resonate with my experience. That's what it means to be community, to be home, to belong. And you and I don't get to know that about one another unless we first hang out with one another. And so beyond us just having our our nice friendships and 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 and, and, and a spoon coons are like me three and no more kind of fellowships. Part of what we're trying to do is figure out how do we expand home and belonging to many more people. And then we have this notion of justice that our church is a touch point where we don't mind having a, 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 a justice centered congregation. And I had some people ask me, Pastor Mike, why does you and your church, why are y'all so justice involved? I say, because I pastor real people. <laughs> Man, <laughs> it's not no altruistic exercise, <laughs> you know, that, that you know, uh, 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 I, I heard a politician talk about a mass shooting, and all of a sudden we care about gun violence. Man, our church in our second year was burying teenagers here in Berkeley and North Oakland. And I got so tired of burying teenagers, me, Pastor Tanisha, a few of us, that we said we're going to have to do something to change all these young people being killed. And then as our church continued to grow, we had members in our church whose family members were being locked up in jail and prison. And so I didn't, we didn't start doing mass incarceration work because I read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and a light came on, ding, 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 ding. But it's because our church had people in our congregation who were directly impacted. And so we, we, had to, we had to respond. And we can go on and on and on. We didn't get involved in housing justice issues because we just have this altruistic uh, concern about, about the unhoused. We have people in our congregation whose economic instability is so intense that they are often left vulnerable to the market forces. That's how they describe it here in this crazy, crazy narrative. So these are... Are, are, are parts of what it means to be at the way because that's who's at the way. And then, of course, our, our, our last pillar, uh, we, we, said, we said faith and spirituality. We said home and belong. We said justice. Our last pillar that makes up some of our secret sauce, if you will, is we are a church who are always trying to de-churchify ourselves. We call it de-churchification. Amen. Somebody say de-churchification. Say that, de-churchification. That, that because many of us come from lots of different church backgrounds, we often bring things with us that don't serve us well. And it's not that we hate our church that produced us or we don't like the faith that our parents gave us. We just realize, you know what, this is not serving me as well as it used to. And so I'm not going to leave Jesus and the church. I'm just going to de-churchify a few things. 
Amen. And 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 I, I was sharing earlier how 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 you know we grew up and we couldn't go to the to the movies. Amen. We 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 was we was we was the holiness Pentecostals, as my pastor said, we were harder than God. Praise God. <laughs> he said, man, we was we was harder than God. And and we 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 saw E.T. In a drive-in at the Cow Palace, all of us together in a in a station wagon, <laughs> because you know we were taught that you know uh, I think I heard Pastor Erna reading it this morning. You read Psalms one? Oh, one nineteen. Okay, well that's not the one. We, we Psalms one says, "Blessed are those who do not sit in the seat of the scornful." <laughs> so the way they interpreted that is the movie theater. Was the, was the scene of the scornful. So we couldn't go to the movies. I see Janeiro clapping back there because he know I'm telling you, he remember them days. Amen. So I remember the first time I snuck to go see Karate Kid in the movies with some of my friends after school. And, and I, was, I, was, I was so nervous. I thought Jesus was going to come back while I was in the movie theater. I was like, oh, man, I know I'm going to hell. This is... I know this is it, but this movie, I want to see the Karate Kid with my friends. So I just sweated through the whole movie. And I was so relieved when I came out and that rapture hadn't happened, boy. I said, thank you, Jesus. But there are things in my mind that I still got to de-churchify from that just don't serve me well. And it don't mean that I don't love Jesus, you don't love Jesus. But how many of you know there are all kind of things that we learn by some of our experiences that was the best we had? There was a time women couldn't preach. In some churches, women still can't preach. But I don't know. I don't even work. I don't know what them churches talk about. I mean, I just, I just behind, it's beyond me. Amen. So I can't even remember what it's like. But some folk have to come to a church and, and get used to being preached to and taught to by a woman. Or by folk who are queer, or by folk who, who may, you know, there was a time where, you know, uh, it, it, used to be, it used to be a bad thing, listen, to have a, <laughs> to have a degree. Amen, like a, 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 a seminary degree. They call it the seminary cemetery. You go, you go to the cemetery. It's gonna take all your spirit. I see some of the, some of the, some of the retired pastors we got here shaking their head. And so we used to, folks used to flip their collar inside out and be like, "I'm a reverend now." Praise God. It's not, not that that basic, but the the whole point is there are things that didn't serve us well, and thanks be to God that we've kept growing. And part of what the secret sauce then two quick things before. Uh, I invite us into a season of thinking and prayer is we must ask God, Lord, as we grow from infancy to uh, something that's a little more mature, how can my maturity be holy and be sacred? That's one of the most important things about the secret sauce you have, to lean into holy maturity, spiritual maturity. The scripture simply says that I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. Why? Because I could only feed you with milk and not meat or not solid food. And one of the great things that you and I must always wrestle with is where are we in the milk to solid food transition of our faith? How are we being called into maturity? Because how many of you know when you're more mature to certain things that you just you just kind of like don't struggle with that much? It, it's not that it don't it don't it, it, it don't bother you. You just like you know it's kind of like you know life is short. And the more I live, the more I realize the thing that I used to major in, I'm gonna start minoring in. Don't mean I'm just gonna ignore it. I'm just gonna minor in it because I become more mature. One of the questions then that you and I must begin to ask ourselves is what kind of, 
of, I call it milk to meat ratio, do you have going on in your spiritual walk? Where are you being invited to grow from infancy to more maturity? Because quiet as it's kept, God is less concerned with your happiness and more with your maturity. Because I believe the more mature you get, the happier you are able to become. I'm not saying God just wants you to be unhappy, but I think that some of us, as we are being formed into the image and the likeness of God, as we grow, we find out that the way to life and peace and joy is not the pursuit of happiness described by the world, by the flesh, but it is something that is of a higher purpose and a higher call. And so what then is our pathway to maturity? On your job, in your relationships, where must you and I grow? How do we ensure we don't just stay locked into the same knowledge that you had when you was a little bit? Amen. But that I'm always growing and I'm always learning. Second thing then that I think I love about this passage is it reminds us in verse number nine that we are God's servants, co-laborers, co-workers, that we are partners in the work that God is doing in the world, that you are God's field and you are God's building. And I love, particularly as we prepare to go into a season of talking and teaching about how we can have relationships and lives that are uh, much more reflective of the, of, of the life of God. The, 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 the theologians called it the perichoresis, the perichoretic life of God where their lives were much radically interdependent, so much so that you could not have one of them showing up without all three. Man, that the, uh, the lives of, of, of God's people, of, of, of our communities are so interdependent that one can't hurt while another part of us celebrate. That when we see the needs of one another, we are leaning into one another's needs. And that the work we do must be done together. That we are working together. There's no lone rangers in the work of God. I know you talented, and I know you gifted, and I know you got all kind of skill sets. But how many of you know that in the work of God, your skill sets don't mean much outside of community? Yes, sir. One could argue that's everywhere. Anybody ever work with someone who thought they was a rock star? Man, they could just do it all by themselves, and then in the eleventh hour, they be calling you like, "Hey, uh, can you give me a ride?" <laughs> Forgot how to plan out my transportation. I used to tell them, no, just use that cape you got and just fly. <laughs> you can't be petty, amen. Tell your neighbor, don't be petty like Pastor Mike, amen. I'm still, I'm still in my transformation role. Somebody say amen. But you and I must do it together. But I love also in this passage how God describes us two ways, real quick. One, you are a field. Think about that for a second. That you are described, we are described in this scripture with the metaphor of a field. You are not the sower in this metaphor. You are a field. That you have soil. You have rich soil that can produce much with the right kind of deposit and nurture. I want you to just appreciate that God sees you, everything about you, all that constitutes you as God's field. God is wanting to deposit things in us that can produce great results. And no matter who you are, where you are, whether it's at home, on your job, at school, 
on a team with yourself, you must see yourself the way God sees you. That you are so precious and fertile that God is waiting to make deposits and seeds in your life that can produce something that others did not even know was possible. Amen. You ought to tell that to some folk this week when they're hating on you, be like, I know you don't know what you're talking about. I'm a field. <laughs> you know, God sees me as a field. And that, the reason why stuff ain't growing in this field is because you got the wrong seeds, man. It ain't the problem with me. But then it also says that you are God's house. Another version says God's building. You are always in construction by the hands of the creator of the universe. I don't know about you, but I, I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a sci-fi person. So, you know, they got great, this is probably one of the best times to be a science fiction fan, because the, 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 the graphics are amazing, you know. Like, I was watching uh, old school Star, Star Trek and old school Star Wars, and you can see, like, you know, camera hands running around in the back, you know. <laughs> and you still have to, ooh, that man, you see that? I was, you, you, you see the lightsabers and they shorten out and stuff like that, and you're like, oh man, they must have hit that real hard. You know, you make up excuses, and now they got new Picard, they got new Star Trek, and new Star Wars, and, and the technology's so good, and you're just like, wow. And then, you know, I got lost in space. I love lost in space, because you, you know, you, you're supposedly in other parts of the galaxy, and you just see all these different constellations, and you just, for me, it's just a, a great testimony to the magnanimity of our creator. That there's a universe out there that is just so unexplored, and it's so expansive. And I want you to think about this, and that same creator describes you as his constant work of art in progress. Anytime you feel like you are having a bad day, you ought to remind yourself, I am God's house. I am God's construction. That nothing happening in my life is out of bounds for God to get some glory. Amen. For God to use everything. Lord, I feel a little preach coming on. Everything in my life, God can use it for some glory. That God can use my trial and my pain, my ups and my downs, so God can spring or fling me out there in the galaxy for others to look at and say, good God, we serve a mighty God. Amen. This is our secret sauce that it is not the one who plants. It is not the one who waters. But it is God that gives us the increase. Amen. Wherever you are, your secret sauce is you have a divine contributor to your life. It's the big mama, like my grandma, who's making sweet potato pie with no recipe. Look like it's just random, just flinging things. But boy, you put that joker in the oven at the right temperature in the right amount of time, and it becomes an unforgettable contribution to life. Stand with me. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you because you remind us that you are a strength like no other. You are a source like no other. You bring to us that which no others can bring. And we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the person I'm touching right now who needs to be reminded of this truth today. That there is a source within them that cannot always be quantified by the naked eye, but we know that it comes from you. It does not come from Apollos. Does not come from Paul. Does not come from McBride. But it comes from you. 
And God, I pray that you will cultivate within the person I'm touching a deep sense of your presence. May they know, God, that you desire to bring them from immaturity to maturity. From milk, Lord God, to solid food. That you want them to grow up so they can experience the greatness of your power and strength. I pray, Lord God, that you will give them a deep sense of the work you are performing in their life. May they know that no matter how they are described to others, that they belong to you, that we belong to one another, that we are your field and your house, your building, and you are constructing us to bring you glory and praise. Now lift those hands right where you're standing. God, we want to invite you to meet us right at the point of our need today. Give us, Lord, what we need to make it through this season and this week. Remind us that we are fearfully, somebody say, I am fearfully, and wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. So this season, Lord, this week, this this month, Lord God, I pray that you will unleash within us a deep sense of your presence so we can always know, God, that there is a strength within us, there is a power within us, there is a hope within us that cannot be extinguished. And we'll say thank you, Lord. I pray for those in this place who need healing in their bodies. You are the healer that heals us. I pray for those who need saving of their souls. You are our savior. I pray for those who need encouraging in their mind. The lifter of our head, joy in our hearts. Do what must be done. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them you got that secret sauce. Tell them that you got that secret sauce.